Yellowstone volcano quake swarm, 1,000 tremors after the Denali, Alaska earthquake, which was 2,000 miles away. Dr. Jake Lowenstern, chief of USGS, describes. This is on today's Caldera Chronicles. As we know, they come out every week. First of all, please let me apologize. I have a cold. It sounds worse than it is, actually. <laughs> all right. So this is t uh, September 23rd. Today's article, they come out every Monday, Caldera Chronicles. This week, column written by scientists and collaborators of Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. This week's contribution is from Jake Lonestern, chief of the USGS Volcano Disaster Assistance Program. He's former scientist in charge of Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. It's been two years now, he says, since I stepped away from Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. And I wanted to take this time to reflect a bit on my experiences with observatory and as a scientist working in Yellowstone. I started as scientist in charge at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, YBO, November 1st, 2002, two days before the Denali earthquake in Alaska. It triggered a suit of 1,000 tremblers at Yellowstone, 2,000 miles away. And sometimes it seemed like things never calmed down. There were numerous more earthquake swarms, uplifts, subsidence of the caldera, and even forest fires. As an observatory, we created science plans, hazard assessments, and crisis pr protocols. And as scientists, we made lots of key observations and published our results. And the public's interest in Yellowstone's volcano, volcanic nature, continued to rise, of course, especially after... 1,000 earthquakes because of this. After 15 years, I was ready to try something different, and I was excited that Mike Poland was ready to take my place. The observatory was also in good hands with Jamie Farrell at the University of Utah, gaining responsibility as YBO's chief seismologist, and Jeff Hungerford ably taking over as Yellowstone Park geologist. Additions of the State Geological Survey, University of Wyoming and UNAFCO, to the consortium of institutions that make up YBO, broadened the scope and capability of the uh, observatory. In January 2018, I moved to the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, where I started as chief of the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, VD uh, VDAP. It's a group of 20 plus volcano experts who assist volcano observatories around the world. With generous support from USAID, we donate volcano monitoring equipment, train colleagues in the U and the use of it, teach geology, seismology, and geochemistry, and assist with forecasts of volcanic activity at dangerous volcanoes that pose threat to populations around the world. It's a job that is very satisfying, knowing that we are improving our partners' ability to protect people, and vastly expanding the expertise of our colleagues. Over the past two years, I've visited volcano observatories in nine countries, helping respond to numerous eruptions and made lots of new friends in the process. I have to admit, I missed lots of aspects of my work at Yellowstone, and this week's Yellowstone Caldera Chronicles, I want to share my top five things I miss and don't miss about working there, in no particular order. Things I miss about Yellowstone and YVO. One, hiking into the backcountry and visiting new thermal areas. Each one is so different and the overnight trips are incredibly fun to plan and carry out. Two, working with y I, uh, YVO colleagues, both of the USGS and other YVO partner agencies. 15 years is enough time to develop a lot of wonderful friends and colleagues and I had the opportunity to work with a lot of smart, motivated, and kind people. Three, geysers. Where else do you get to work? In a place with geysers. Somehow, however, steamboat geyser erupted only six times during my tenure, including only two in the last 11 years, post-2006. With 68 and counting eruptions in 2018-19, I'm starting to take this personally. What the heck, Yellowstone? he says here. Number four, research. The geology of Yellowstone is pretty amazing. You have two billion year old 
bare-tooth basement rocks, 50 million year old petrified forests, Anab Soroka volcanoes, volcanics, the recent Yellowstone Plateau volcanic field with its giant ignimbrites and lava flows, and then the imprint of hydrothermal activity interacting with it all. What a wonderland. Number five, the animals. I have to admit I wasn't too pleased when we had multiple backcountry trips cancelled due to marauding grizzly bears, but I am glad that those awe inspiring animals have a home at Yellowstone. I never saw a lynx or a wolverine, but I saw pretty much every other major critter that calls the park home. Okay, time now for the things I don't miss. One, bear jams. If you've ever been to Yellowstone in the summer, you know what I'm talking about. You could spend hours in traffic in a three-mile backup of cars stops so that people can stare at the bear scratching its ear a quarter of a mile away. Bison jams are just as bad. Two is road construction. Pretty much every year there's some part of the park that cancelled that's challenging to reach or closed due to road improvements. In contrast with bear jams, you can plan around this particular inconvenience, but you don't usually get to see a bear. Number three, he doesn't miss the mosquitoes. Granted, we almost always planned our visits to Yellowstone to avoid these pests, but they could certainly ruin an afternoon hike or sampling trip in June. Four, supervolcano. Trying to serve as a source of public information on this topic is clearly a no-win deal. Yes, these kinds of events do occur somewhere on Earth every few tens of thousands of years, and yes, if it happens again, it could be devastating to society. But no, there is minimal chance that Yellowstone is going to erupt this century. He says, but no, there is minimal chance that Yellowstone is going to erupt this century, and we are not hiding evidence to the contrary. Get over it. Number five. Actually, there really are not five to gripe about. It's too nice a place. So he says here, thanks for reading. If you'd like to see some of my photos and travels around Yellowstone, you can visit this article I wrote last year for the Traveling Geologist website. Okay, now in these Caldera Chronicles, Dr. Lorisern talks about the Denali, Alaska earthquake, a thousand earthquakes in that swarm, and subsidence and changes in the Caldera area. These are, of course, the, all the young faults of the Yellowstone National Park just around the Caldera. And there's a lot more on the northwest. There's even cracks lately that have been... Well, when you have a caldera and you have actions, you always have cracks. Recently, this map came out in April of this year. And you can see that around the 7 o'clock position on this image, you have a dashed circle around the Ridgecrest Salton Sea area. This shows the red uh, blob that's under there and also stretching into... Long Valley Supervolcano Caldera, and also uh, the High Threat Volcanoes, and also uh, going northeast towards Yellowstone. Okay, this is another connection, as you see, from Ridgecrest to Yellowstone. But uh, we also know that 20 years ago, they had a 7.1 earthquake in Ridgecrest, California, and that gave... Yellowstone a quake swarm as well. And when uh, we recently had the July 4th and 5th earthquakes in Ridgecrest, I had already read um, this article concerning Ridgecrest Yellowstone earthquake connections. We recently found that there's the same plume underneath. There we go. You can see that right there. Okay? This is not fear-mongering. It's just that's the way it is. It's a subduction zone, and it's got a plume from U.S.-Mexico border going towards the Cascades and also the other arm going towards Yellowstone. So this has recently been found, uh, and uh, it's logical as to why, 20 years ago, we had the earthquakes from Ridgecrest affecting a quake swarm in Yellowstone. Yellowstone also had earthquake swarm after the 8.8 .8 Julie earthquake and also after the Haiti earthquake. 
Now, why did that happen? You see how sensitive Yellowstone is. That blob underneath is very sensitive. I'll leave links below for you for this on Caldera Chronicles this week. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.